Hey crew, it's Ben, and I'm back with another Bible study. Today we're going to be back into Genesis. And if you are new here, if you have not been following along with the Genesis study, you want to start from the top because I'm on a different track than most people, and I would hate for you to get your feelings hurt. With that being said, we are jumping into Genesis 34 because we finished up Genesis 33. We are insisting on a literal translation of the, or a literal reading of the Bible. That's why I'm reading word by word. And if something's confusing, we will look the word up. If we need to know where the place is, we will look it up on Google Earth. We go and find out what this actually says. And what it actually says is not what we have been taught before. We finished up with Genesis 33, and that is Jacob re reuniting with his brother Esau. Now we're going to get into the story of Dinah, and this is this is one of those very problematic stories that most people will not deeply dive into because it is so problematic. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Okay. When Shechem, son of the Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the region, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young girl and spoke to her tenderly. So Shechem told his father Hamor, Give me this girl as a wife. Jacob heard that Shechem had deviled his daughter Dinah, but since his sons were with the, his livestock in the field, he remained silent about it until they returned. And meanwhile, Shechem's father Hamor came to speak with Jacob. And when Jacob's sons heard what had happened, they returned from the field. And they were filled with grief and fury because Shechem had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. But Amor said to them, My son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You may settle among us and the land will be open to you. Live here, move about freely, and acquire your own property. Then Shechem said to Dinah's fathers and brothers, Grant me this favor, and I will give you whatever you ask. Demand as high a dowry and an expensive gift, and I will give you whatever you ask. Only give me the girl as my wife. All right. So, already, there's a lot to unpack right here. Previous to this, Jacob has already been told to change his name. Right. Let's not forget that, because it's going to happen again in a minute. And... Generally speaking, when that happens in the Bible, it happens immediately. You don't go a couple of chapters later using the same name, like a significant portion of time later using the same name, right? When Abram was told to change to Abraham, he did it. When Sarah was told to change to Sarah, she did it. And so when Jacob is told to change to Israel, yeah, whatever. I'll get to it eventually, right? Okay, that that's straight off the top. And now Dinah is the daughter Leah had born to Jacob. So uh, this is the the first wife. The daughter was like way down the line of succession, right? So not even in the line of succession. So, and they go to the lands of Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite. Let's uh let's see if we can pop up that real quick. All right, uh. I want to see Hivite, Archite, Sinite, so the land of Sinai, maybe, the daughter of Zibion, the Canaanite tribe. So, yeah, basically northern Israel. Like that, that's, that's where we're talking about. And so we're back into northern Israel from the Jordan area where he was with his brother, I guess. And uh, the prince of the region sees her, takes her by force. And his soul is drawn to her, the daughter of Jacob. And he saw the young girl and spoke to her tenderly. Severe contradictions going on right here. Like super, super severe contradictions. Because either he saw her and took her and lay with her by force, right? Or he loved the girl and he spoke to her tenderly. He did not do both. Because he may speak to her tenderly, but if he took her by force, then he did not love her. And if this is the infallible word of God, then we have a severe problem right here. But because it's an amalgamation of stories, we're okay, right? Because the overarching message that is conveyed by the book 
is still conveyed despite the best efforts of men, we're okay, right? Well, in this particular instance, not so much, because Jacob, the coward that he is, and we have seen that, right? He's the thief and a coward so far. Finds out that his daughter was raped, right? That's what we're, we're led to, def, to believe because he lay with her by force. And so he, he finds out that his daughter Dinah was, defor, was defiled. But since his sons were with the livestock, he's like, yeah, I'll just wait till they show up. <sighs> now, as a father, I can tell you that's not my reaction. But I'm not, I've never been known as a cow. And me, then, uh, then the father comes, right? Like, and he's like, okay, so my son raped your daughter, but he really wants to marry her. Again, I know that that is referenced a couple of times in this book, but you that that's a hard sell. Like, as a father, if she consensually lays with this man who spoke tenderly to her and loved her, then I would consider the marriage. But if he took her and lay with her by force, then nothing less than his head is going to satisfy me. Like nothing less. And that's just all there is to that. Now, that is anecdotally, right? That is me speaking as me. But I can't think that God cares any less for his daughters than I do. I can't imagine that. And so I'm more inclined to believe from the context of this that what actually happened here was a consensual relationship that they didn't know about. And either, as is, I hate to say, prone to happen because it's not really like the most common, but it is common enough that once the consensual relationship was found out, then all of a sudden it became a force situation. I'm not inclined to overlook that possibility. And so the fact that he shows up and he's like, look, he really wants to marry her makes me think that it was a consensual relationship that got found out. And then Jacob just got mad because he didn't know and it was outside of his control. And that is how men react to things outside of their control is they tend to get angry. And so he got angry, but it wasn't necessarily a, 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 a forced non-consensual situation, right? But his anger could have provoked her to say that it was, and it's definitely recorded that it was. And the brothers heard that it was, that it had been done and they were filled with grief and fury and hurried home as you would expect if it was by by force right but but the the the, the father-in-law comes and says grant me this favor and i'll give you whatever you ask come and intermarry with our families right that's not something that it, it, it just doesn't mesh for a non-consensual situation like, especially in a culture where honor is held so highly, right? Now, I don't doubt that the virtue problem was a problem culturally here. The fact that she had lain with a man was probably a severe problem. I just find it hard to believe that it's going to be this situation where, okay, my son raped your... My son non-consensually aggravated upon your daughter, but you know what, y'all just come and marry with us and party with us and chill with us. Like, that just doesn't, it doesn't mesh. Like, we're not going to have that relationship past that point. You're not even going to be able to bring that to me, right? You're going to come to me with that, and I'm, I'm going to get mad at you now, not just your son. All right, so, and then we get into some really problematic stuff, right? And because Shechem defiled their sister Dinah, Jacob's sons answered him and, and his father Hamor, Hamor deceitfully. We cannot do such a thing, they said. To give our sister to an uncircumcised man would be a disgrace to us. We will consent to this on one condition, that you become circumcised like us, every one of your males. And then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We will dwell among you and become one people. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, then we will take our sister and go. 
do you know what the problem is here? Like, one of the problems is that the circumcision hasn't been given yet. That doesn't come in until later. We're going to get into that, but we're not there yet, right? I'm fairly positive. Like, details do slip my mind's timeline sometimes. Like, I have to go back and review, right? But I do remember the overarching story. And I'm pretty sure that the, the circumcision comes as an act of faith a little bit later on in the story. And so... Yeah, I'm pretty sure. We haven't seen that with Isaac. We haven't seen that with Abraham. We have not seen that with Noah for sure. And so we don't have a circumcision yet. So already we have a problem here. Like straight off the top, this is another consistency error. And this is this is insurmountable, right? If the circumcision is not given until later, then why are you demanding it of someone who is not yours now? That's one problem. Here's another one. Like... Let's go ahead and finish the story out. Like this, this we're going to finish this out, and then we're going to come back to this because the next problem is a bigger one. And so we would, then we would give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves, and we will dwell among you and become one people. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, we will take our sister and go. And their offer seemed good to Hamor and his son Shechem, the young man who was the most respected of all his father's household, did not hesitate to fulfill this request. Because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. And then Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and addressed the men of their city. These men are at peace with us. Let them live and trade in our land. Indeed, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. But only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us and be one with our people. If all of our men are circumcised as they are, Will not their livestock, their possessions, and all their animals become ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell among us. And all the men who went out to the, of the city gate listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male of the city was circumcised. And then three days later, while they were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, uh, Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, took their swords, went into the unsuspecting city, and slaughtered every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with their swords, took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and went away. Jacob's other son came upon the slaughter and looted the city, because their sister had been defiled. And they took the flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else in the city or the field. They carried off all of their possessions and women and children and plundered everything in their houses. And then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble onto me by making me a stench to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people of this land. We are few in number. If they unite against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they replied, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? All right, let's get back to the unpacking. We have another very severe problem in this verse and the very severe problem in this verse is when you make a covenant with God he holds you to it right and when you extend that covenant to include other people then they are also included and so if you extend to them the covenant of the circumcision which was not a thing yet but it will be a thing eventually and this is the amalgamation, so it's okay. But if you give to them the covenant of God's blessing due to the circumcision, and you agree to live in peace and intermarry and commingle, and you betray your oath, there is a problem. You no longer can be blessed by God until the repentance happens. Until you change, God cannot give you good things for being an oath breaker. It is inconsistent with him. All the way, all the way, when he makes a covenant, he is true. 
if you have extended his covenant to ex include others, he will too. And so if you betray that extension, then you are damned. Not just like a little bit, but like you are anathema at that point. You are like, like pork becomes. Like that is what you are. If somebody touches you, they have to cleanse themselves. Because you are an oath breaker. And this is 11 oath breakers. Right? Two of them, the most egregious, Simeon and Levi. Because what do they do? They go in and kill everybody while they're injured from taking the oath to God. That is especially accursed. And you're telling me that this is the house's that are chosen to be the priests. We've got a problem. Now, I know that this is going to be seriously wrong for some people and that y'all are going to be mad at me. But don't be mad at me for reading the book. Don't be mad at me for holding the people involved to the standard of the one they are supposed to serve. Like they're telling us that they are the servants of the one true God and their way is the way. And their way here is to say, okay, I'm going to be duplicitous with you. I'm going to agree to this and then betray my oath and kill you while you are unable to protect yourself. That is so much cowardice it cannot be expressed that is taking the cowardice of the father who has been not the father but Jacob and multiplying it because at least Jacob just ran away he didn't sneak in in the middle of the night and killed Laban right he just took all his shit and his daughters and he took off these guys go and kill people who cannot defend themselves and then steal all their stuff and say, well, well, what did you expect? My sister willingly slept with you. And if you don't believe even now that that happened, where's, uh, where's it at? Right here. Uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? All the men went out. Here it is, right here. And their offer seemed good to Hamor and his son Shechem. And the young man, who was the most respected of all his father's household, did not hesitate to fulfill the request because he was delighted in Jacob's daughter. He spoke tenderly to her. He loved her. I don't think that there was a non-consensual issue here at all. I think that that... It's part of this grand deception that we've already been exposing, right? This whole web is based upon a lie. Everything from Noah forward seems to be bad. Like, like not, not me deciding this is bad, but bad according to the laws God laid down. It says, do not bear false witness. And they give a duplicitous oath in God's name under his covenant. Like, that's that's taking the name of the Lord God in vain is what that's doing. That is being blasphemous. You're saying that my God is going to accept you if you do this thing and then killing them when they do it. No, son. No, son, that is not how my God works. He is faithful and true. He is un unable to be duplicitous. He is not telling you, if you do this, I will do this. And then he doesn't. If he tells you, you do this, and I will do this, he does it faithfully and true every time. Now, you may waver, and you may fall off the path, and you may not get the blessings that you thought you were owed, but that's not on him. That's because you wavered and you fell off the path. Not him. What we got here, though? We're going to go ahead and do 35 because it's short. Um, I think we hit everything we needed to here. Like, this is a severe, 
severe contradiction in doctrinal reasoning. Like, what happened in Genesis 34 is a travesty. And if it was not recorded and apologized for so many times, people would look at, the, if, if you came across this story, right? If you just came across Genesis 34 and it did not have the little blue tick marks here that tell you that they're separated. And it just read like a story. And the names were changed and there was no Jacob or Simeon and Levi. And they were just changed to Joe and Bob and George. And you read this, you would be like, wow, these people are evil. You would. Because what they did was completely evil. Now, if she was actually raped and they were righteous in their anger and they went in there and they handled God's business, that's one thing, right? That is a whole different issue. But that is not what happened. That is not what they told us happened. And if you read this, you can tell what really happened if you have the slightest bit of discernment. And like, I pray for discernment every day. So, And if I'm wrong, I will accept correction. I ask him for correction every day. If I am wrong, correct me. But he, he doesn't. He blesses me instead. So, Genesis 35. Jacob returns to Bethel. Now, at this point, he just, his, his sons, just his sons, he wasn't involved at all, right? His sons have decided that they're going to kill everybody. And so now there's problems. And then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Oh boy. Oh boy, that's getting problematic now, isn't it? Now it's getting a little bit problematic, this God of Bethel. Now, now it's getting a little bit problematic. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. And so Jacob went to his household and to all that were with him and get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. What? Whoa. Whoa. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Let us arise and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. But you have not been with him. Why? Why should we assume that God is going to continue to be faithful to this man? That is to never, ever say that you are too far gone into a sin path that you cannot be redeemed because you can't. Regardless of what you have done, even now, Simeon and Levi could repent and turn to the Lord. They didn't. <laughs> what they replied was, we were right. They didn't say we were wrong. They didn't even consider that they were wrong. But they're worshiping foreign gods. They're not holding their own covenant. That is, doesn't exist yet. They're not even holding that yet. Right? Arise and let us go to Bethel and build an altar to God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. But he hasn't. Like, if you... If you blessings can come from the alternative source as well. Right? The enemy can bless you with things that mimic the blessings of God. But they always have an undercurrent, right? When you're being blessed by the wrong one, you're being blessed and there's a, a fear that you're going to lose it. Or there's a pride in the accomplishment that you have and that it's just going to disappear. There's always an undercurrent of one of those sins that keeps you a little bit fearful that it's all going to go away because you know that it wasn't given to you by the one true God. It was given to you for the wrong reasons. These people like Sam Smith who are going out here and they are doing literal worship of the, of, of the enemy, right? They're getting blessed by that, but they know in their mind that at the snap of a finger, it can be gone because those blessings are not the true blessings of God. They are the blessings of the enemy and they are as tenuous as this world is. Jacob has been blessed by the wrong one. He has been given gifts and blessed by the wrong faction. Abram was blessed by the wrong faction. These are not good people who are not even trying to be good. They're not striving for God at all. 
they're saying the right words. I worship God. They say that, but they do not mimic that in their actions. His sons, he says, he has been with me wherever I've gone. And then he, right after he tells them to get rid of these gods. Well, if he is with you wherever you have gone, then these gods are not with you. They're not in your household. There's none to get rid of. And so they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and all their earrings, and Jacob buried them under the oak near Shechem. And as they set out, a terror from God fell over the surrounding cities so that he did not pursue Jacob's sons. And so Jacob and everyone with him arrived in Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. And there Jacob built an altar, and he called that place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to Jacob as he fled from his brother. Okay. Now, consistency. When this book was put together, it was an oral tradition. And there were a whole bunch of stories, right? Even, even in the best possible consideration that they were traditional stories passed down word for word from the time of Adam until the time of Moses. And that it was a true and faithful representation of it right regardless you're going to have some inconsistencies that pop up in different tribes in different areas or wherever this is some of that and it is amalgamated and put together because some people knew that he built the altar before when he fled from his brother and some people knew that he built the, the altar after he murdered all the the canaanites and so that's where we're at right here He's building the altar again. Where's the altar that you built before? Are you telling me that the altar that you built to God just disappeared in the, what was it, by now, maybe 25 years? The, these rocks that you piled up in the wilderness just fell over? This altar that you sanctified to the Lord God Almighty is gone. So you've got to build a whole brand new one. And you've got to consecrate it in the same name all over again. No, no. This is an amalgamation, and that's okay, as long as we bear that in mind and understand that this is not the literal, word for word, how everything happened. But it is a very good general overview of what happened, and it is, it is a good clue into the mindset, right? These are the things that they're bragging about. This is the, the history that they are the most proud of. When they write this down and they tell you that they deceitfully tricked and murdered defenseless men they're not ashamed of that that that's a, a, a myth story of heroism because they justified it to you they told you it was rape it's okay <laughs> and so Jacob gave all their foreign gods and all their earrings and Jacob buried them under the oak now it's interesting that he buried them under an oak because if you don't know in paganism, oak is a strong tree. It is a tree with great roots, and it has a lot of implications. I'm not going to get into that because we're not dealing with paganism today. We're dealing with, with this. And he buries them under the oak. And as they set out, a terror from God fall over the surrounding cities so that they did not pursue Jacob's sons. God's servants can be absolutely terrifying. Let's soak in the other sides. And just because it tells you that the terror came from God does not mean that it did. Be discerning. Don't take it from me. Like, I'm reading this to you, and we are reading it, and I'm telling you my thoughts, but I'm just reading you what it says. I'm not trying to spin it. I'm just reading what it says and what I think that it means when it says it. I'm trying to take it as literally as it is possible to take it. But I do emphatically believe that not only is there a God, but there is an enemy. I do believe that there are both angels and demons, and that sometimes they are indistinguishable, except by their intentions and by their countenance. And so, what is happening is that the influence is the wrong one. It's not the angels of God that are coming 
It's the deceiver coming, pretending to be, and making the duplicitous covenant. That's what I'm seeing happening here. <laughs> and uh, and so they arrive back, and he builds it, and he, he renames the place the same thing that he named it before. And now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. So again, we're bringing in the oak tree. I may have to do an oak tree study, but... Like, the oak is a very, very powerful tree in pagan mythology. And a lot of this book is based off of pagan mythology. So, there is that. <clears throat> and so, Jacob named it Elon Bakuth. And after Jacob returned from Ptah Aram, Jacob appeared to him again and blessed him. And God said to him, Though your name is Jacob, you will no longer be called Jacob. Instead, your name will be Israel. And so God named him Israel. Again. Now, it is entirely possible because this particular thing, this mimics what we saw earlier. He didn't just come from Padan Aram. He came from Canaan. Right? He, and so, consistency. It, it, it's just consistency errors. Like all the way through Genesis, there's consistency errors. Now, there are doctrinal errors. We, we discussed one just now, but there's multiple of those. But, there's a lot of consistency problems. And as long as you look at it as it's taking these stories and combining them into the myth that is necessary for the, the, the freed Israelites coming from Egypt to have a creation myth, then it's okay. But if you're taking it as the literal word of God that is infallible, then you're making a big mistake. Never to take away from the power of the book the power of God to use the book. But the book itself is not infallible. So God named him Israel. And God told him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, even a company of nations, shall come from you, and kings shall defend, descend from you. The land I gave to I, Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. And then God went up from the place where he had spoken with him. And so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where God had spoken to him, a stone marker, and poured out a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. And Jacob called the place where God had spoken to him Bethel. Now the drink offering is going to be wine, right? Almost certainly it is going to be wine. And that's going to piss some people off because alcohol. But again, we're getting into the consistency problem, right? The, the timing of this happening twice. It's the exact same thing, right? And so I'm just going to let it go. We're not going to deal with that anymore. But And later, they set out from Bethel, and while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel gave birth, began to give birth, and her labor was difficult. And during her severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not be afraid, for you are having another son. And with her last breath, for she was dying, she named him ben -Onai. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, and it marks Rachel's tomb to this day. Israel set out again set out and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. Let's look that up real quick. The Tower of Eder. I want to know where that is. So, it is a flock tower near Bethlehem. Okay. So just... A known place, right? the Tower of a Flock, a place in Palestine. So it is an actual physical location, not like, okay. I just wanted to see. I, I never noticed that before, so I wanted to see. I wanted to make sure it wasn't the Tower of Babel or the Tower of whatever. But, and while Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Billah. And Israel heard about it. And Jacob had 12 sons, and the sons of Leah were Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's maidservant were Belna, oh, maidservant Belna, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Leah's maidservant, Zilpha, were Gad and Asher. These were, are the sons of Jacob, not Israel, who were born to him in Paddan Aram. And Jacob returned to his father Isaac at Mamre, near Kirath Arba, that is Hebrew, and Abram and Isaac had stayed. 
and Isaac lived 180 years, and then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Not Esau and Isaac, or not Esau and Israel, Esau and Jacob. Again, we're getting into the consistency problem, right? If he has Israel now, then he should be Israel now. He has been named Israel twice. From now on, he should be Israel. There should be no further reference to Jacob. But it's it's a consistency problem. Uh, the, the I'm not sure if we get back into the the he goes in and sleeps with his his father's wife like that just happens and like it's just past right passing. Uh, yeah, right here. He sets out and pitches his tent, and while he's there, Reuben goes in and sleeps with his his father's wife. Uh, or maidservant, concubine. It's not his wife. But we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. But I'm just trying to show consistency errors. There are doctrinal errors, absolutely. But even in Genesis, like most of the doctrine that is coming is not set up. Like Before Noah, there was no meat. You were not given meat to eat. So why was there a meat sacrifice? prior to, right? Cain and Abel, there was a meat sacrifice. Well, if you weren't given meat to eat, why were you sacrificing it? That's a doctrinal error. It's consistency error, but it's doctrinal. This, this is really damning for almost all the faiths on the planet. And that's like the amount of hubris involved in just saying something like that, right? Like, I am fully aware of that. And if it was not for the fact that I have been specifically, like, pushed into this, like, he has pushed me into it, not people, but he uses people to push me. And there's a whole lot that's just not consistent, and we are showing it. I'm going through, insisting upon a literal translation. Like, we are just reading what it says. And what it is saying is that the people who are blessed are not consistent with the character of God. And that doesn't make sense. Even if you're assuming that the, the covenant is going to make up for it, right? We've got, we've got references to covenants that don't exist. We've got references to breaking covenants and being blessed. We've got a blatant admission of using the covenant with God to murder defenseless men. And that's who you're going to make the nations of the world. Anyway. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a very complicated topic. I am fully aware that there is going to be a lot of people who are going to hate me for this, and I'm okay with that because he loves me, and he's the only one that matters. I am only here trying to do what he's telling me to do, and that is to peel away that requirement that you all think was there. There was never a required sacrifice. Never. There was a sacrifice willingly giving that was freely accepted. And there were sacrifices that you were told to give, but he didn't tell you to give that. The other faction told you to give that. A lot of people like to think that the other faction doesn't have that big of a part to play in this, but the other faction is who told Abram to go and sacrifice his son on the altar when there had not been that done before. Right? Right? We're not going to rehash, but hopefully there's not too much confusion. Hopefully you can see what I'm saying. And if you want to call me a heretic and play me in the comments, be blessed. My God don't trifle though, so y'all be careful with your tone. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me. I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.